hymn number three. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim. All his souls together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise Him, all ye heavens, ye heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let the praise give Jehovah, for His name alone is high, and His glory is exalted. And His glory is exalted. And His glory is exalted for above the earth and sky. Let the praises give Jehovah. They were made at His command. Then forever he established his decree shall never stand from the earth so praise Jehovah all ye flood ye dragon soul fire and hail and snow and vapors stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise, let Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted for above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, Birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes greater, judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise and give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Amen. Amen. Number 68. For me? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Sixty-eight. Give thanks. Let us sing. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He is given. Jesus Christ, His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what 
the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give Give thanks. Amen. 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 Brother Tony. One more time. Pardon me? Let's try that one more time. The last, the last part. Just do it over. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks. Because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what? The Lord has not given, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. The ladies do the top. You you would do the top. I would. Lead. Lead. Okay. Okay. And, and so we would do the. So under the bottom, we would do the give, the brother, give thanks, okay. give thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to do the prayer? Sure. Is Daryl here? Oh, okay. All right. Shall we pray? Dimly Father, it's again that we come approaching your throne this day, Dimly Father. Just being ever so thankful, Dimly Father, that you're a loving and a merciful God, dimly Father. Understanding, dimly Father, that you are the creator of heaven and earth. And that yet, dimly Father, yet you are the author and finisher of our faith. We want to come just saying thank you, God, for just being a loving God. We want to thank you, dimly Father, for this day that you've given unto us. Because in this day, dimly Father, there are many who have not seen it. We just want to thank you that you've been so gracious and so kind to allow us to rise up out of our beds of slumber. You've allowed us to work, Heavenly Father, this day and to go about the things that we need to take care of and the things we need to do. And we're ever so thankful, for the Heavenly Father, that we have your word to put us in remembrance, Heavenly Father, that tonight we have set aside a time to come together to study your word, Heavenly Father. And our prayer, dimly Father, is for yet every Christian, that we may have a desire to want to know more about you. And we know that comes, dimly Father, through studying. We know that we, the Apostle Paul said that he had not attained. And so, dimly Father, we should not feel comfortable as though we have attained something. And so knowledge is always something good, dimly Father. And we pray for our brothers and sisters who are providentially hindered, that cannot be here, we pray, Dimly Father, for those who may have fallen short. We ask, Dimly Father, that you will give them ample time and that they may understand that we come together, Dimly Father, to hear your word, but also to build up and to encourage each other, Dimly Father, as we walk this fight of faith here on this earth. We pray, Dimly Father, that you will be with our sick and afflicted, especially those in the household of faith throughout this land and country, Dimly Father. We pray for Sister Paula, Dimly Father, and ever so thankful that you've yet given her another day, dimly Father. When the doctors feel that there is no time, well, we know, dimly Father, you are the great physician. And we just give you thanks for all of your saints that you have just touched, dimly Father, and shown them mercy to just to be able to go on and to have strength, dimly Father, and to give us that encouragement, dimly Father, that when one day we may have to walk down that, that road, we may be able to walk boldly as they are, Dimly Father. We ask, Dimly Father, that you will be with uh, Khadijah and Debray as they are away, Dimly Father. They may be listening, and we pray, Dimly Father, that they may be edified from the things, from your word. They may be encouraged 
to know, dear Heavenly Father, they are loved even though they are away. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll be with Brother Darrell. As dear Heavenly Father, we know this task is a hard task. Not only uh, does he study your word, but he works a full job, dear Heavenly Father. And he does, you know, so much. So we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'll continue to give him strength. You'll continue to build him up. You continue to encourage his family, dear Heavenly Father, to be there and to support him. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the brothers here at Palomar, that, dear Heavenly Father, that we also, we may stand in the gap, dear Heavenly Father, to be able to help, to assist where we can, to do those things that we know we can do, dear Heavenly Father, and to do them to the ability in which you give unto us. We just ask now, dear Heavenly Father, that this service we give tonight will be beneficial, dear Heavenly Father, to us all in this wealth and pleasing in your sight. In your son Jesus' name, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the beautiful songs, Brother David. Thank you for the wonderful prayer, uh, Brother Tony. It's good to see everyone here tonight. And uh, as mentioned, I do apologize for the brief tardiness. But we want to go ahead and dive right in. We don't want to stay on that porch too long. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but the lesson that, uh, that we're going through right now is part three, lesson uh, preparation and delivery. This could be uh, for uh, teachers and or preachers. And it was something that Brother Bowers, before he passed, uh, they used to have Church of Christ conferences once a year. Or not maybe once a year, but every other year or so, where they would... Um, some congregations would send one or two Bible study teachers to a central location, and they would take a whole week, and they would train people how to be Bible teachers. Um, and one of the struggles you have sometimes when you have a small congregation is you have <clears throat> well-intentioned people, well-meaning people, but they may not have really kind of like the structure to be able to take the knowledge that they have and explain it to someone else. And that's not to say that they can't do it, but we're talking about effectiveness uh, because you see some of the greatest athletes, uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, uh, they were SMEs, subject matter experts, but they didn't always have the patience and the understanding to be able to take all that expertise that they had and transfer it to someone else. And then you'll see someone like a Phil Jackson who was a you know, medium, middle-of-the-road player for all of his playing days, and he ends up being one of the greatest, uh, most winningest NBA coaches uh, in history. And the difference was that he simply learned how to teach. They all had the knowledge, but some took the time to study and learn how to teach. So we're going to go uh, into that a little bit tonight in the next few weeks. Uh, we'll probably be on this. I, I don't know where we'll end up. We may end up with 10 parts or so, but Tonight was, will be the last portion of the introduction phase to this, so just bear with us as we're still going through that introduction phase. I thought that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 20 through 25 was very important to us, uh, where the Word of God lets us know where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach what? Christ, Christ crucified. That is the central theme of all of our preaching and teaching. There's a lot of other things that we want to learn and we can get into uh, that we ought to because we want to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. But what the Apostle Paul here was letting the Corinthians church know was that when it came down to the nitty-gritty and the nuts and bolts, they preached Christ and him crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So this could be some mode of a mission statement for us. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit. I hope I got my slides uh, in order. I kind of juggled them just before I had to make my way over here. So we'll just uh, put our faith and trust in the Lord on that one. But general awareness of the responsibility. Uh, number one is the purpose. 
And then number two is our motivation for doing whatever it is that we're doing. And number three is do we have the anointing? And when we uh, looked up that word and studied it, we know that one of the meanings of anointing is simply permission. It means permission. So in terms of purpose, we want to look at our inspiration. And in terms of uh, motivation, we want to look at our dedication. And then in terms of the uh, uh, anointing, we want to look at our authentication. Because it's one thing for us to volunteer for assignment, uh, but then we don't follow through. Or we volunteer for an assignment, or we don't uh, prepare ourselves. Or we volunteer for an assignment, but we have ulterior motives. So these are some concepts that are very important because we must, when we take on these, uh, these responsibilities, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, there's a great responsibility to be someone that's in a position to either teach children or to teach uh, Christians or teach the world or what, which, whichever portion uh, that you're doing uh, serving God in his kingdom, uh, we must make sure that we have the right purpose, the right motivation, and then uh, the right uh, anointing. Uh, some general awareness continued. James chapter number three comes to mind. I would probably focus only on verse number one. Uh, but for this, what I did was I looked at it in several translations just so that we could get the, fa- the flavor. And it talks about the, uh, uh, how we should be aware. So the King James version of James chapter number three, verse number one, my brethren, be not many masters knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. If you would take James chapter number 3 and continue to read down into uh, all the way to verse number 12 and beyond, he starts right here, James does, and he starts to talk about the tongue. And so it's very important for us that if we are going to be teachers or preachers, that we have an understanding of the responsibility that is entrusted upon us when we have to take on such a a noble task. We see James chapter number 3, verse number 1 in in an NASB, 95. Uh, Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, since you know that we who are teachers will incur stricter judgment. This goes back to having us pause for a moment and understand uh, the importance of the position uh, of a teacher and or a preacher. We look at the same uh, text in the Young's Literal Translation. Many teachers become not my brethren, having known the greater judgment we shall receive. And the NIV says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I've said this from a personal perspective, uh, even in some of uh, the sermons. uh, I personally would rather sit down and not preach or teach than to knowingly get up and say something that I haven't been prepared for or I haven't studied or I haven't done my own homework or is just flat out uh, false doctrine. We're not here to give our opinion. And we'll talk about uh, opinions a little bit a little bit later. I wanted to ask you guys before we got going, since we're on this subject, do you remember the ends of speaking that was in lesson number one? I just wanted to see if anybody fell asleep on that, uh, on that course. You guys remember the ends of speaking? You guys remember how many of them there were? There were three. Amen. What were they? Amen. Amen. I didn't put them to sleep, Brother David. They are to persuade, to inform, and to entertain. Now, when Brother Bowers gave this to us, I had to test him, Sister D. Not in a bad way, not, you know, Tony in, in the class or anything, but I, because I had a two-hour drive coming home. So I had to think. I said, what does he mean? What is he talking about? So when I thought it through, at least for me, I said, it's it's generally right. You might find some little subcategories, but but typically the majority of all speech is to persuade, inform, or entertain. And that's just a little acronym there, P-I-E, 
to help you remember it. It was just something that kind of caught my eye. What is teaching or preaching? Now, obviously, we're looking at it from a, a biblical perspective, not from a uh, necessarily an academic perspective right now. Uh, we'll touch on some theology later tonight if we can. We'll look at it from uh, more of an academic's perspective as far as the scriptures. But for now, preaching has also been identified as the authori authoritative proclamation of the word of the living God by living men of God in God's ordained manner of moving people to Christ and salvation on to eternal life. These are not my words. These are someone else's assessment of Romans chapter number 10. I just want to make that clarification uh, to you. Uh, but if you go on and if you looked at Romans 10, 14 through 17, it says, how then shall they call on him who have, they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of who they have not heard? <coughs> Excuse me. And how shall they hear without what? I use that word preacher and teacher interchangeably uh, because it's not just a pulpiteer or someone that uh, uh, presents a monologue. It could be you uh, giving someone a ride home from school one day or you just, uh, you know, sitting in the park and you, someone comes up and you have a conversation. So preacher or teacher. And how shall they pe preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. And some people think that, you know, I don't want to get into that faith-only stuff. But here, verse 16, clearly lets us know there's an, a component of obedience that is part of the gospel. Verse 16 again. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report. You guys know what he's talking, who he's quoting there? I mean, what, what, uh, what book and chapter he's quoting there? Yeah, you're right there. You, amen, amen. Isaiah 53, verse number one. Who, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is at this point that preaching differs from all public speech and rises above secular activity. As mentioned, Brother Bowers was a um, dean of communications at Pepperdine University. So he, uh, glad, I'm glad that he was able to separate uh, his public speaking uh, skill sets, if you will, and kind of define when it comes down to preaching and uh, and or teaching. Preaching does not consist in excellency of speech. Uh, many preachers and or teachers um, struggle with this, particularly if you are seeing someone else that speaks eloquently or seeing someone else that's a very good teacher in a class or you're seeing someone else that has a good command of English language or the Greek, then, you know, sometimes, you know, sub subliminally we may try to emulate that. Well, it's not always about that. And that's what we're seeing here by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. But let me continue reading. Preaching does not consist in excellently of speech or wisdom and power of the world, but in the testimony, wisdom, and power of God in his word. This does not mean we should not study. This does not mean we should not prepare. This does not mean we should not work towards a goal within a given time frame because we know that we're dealing with people and they don't have long atten attention spans so that we can just get up and ramble. We want to be concise but, but compassionate. We want to be understanding uh, yet forceful when it's needed. We want to be direct but flexible when that's needed. So Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 gave where his source came from. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you as save Christ and what? Man, we're going right back to that cross. Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power 
of God. A couple of things on this was at the end of our course, uh, the students, we had to uh, conduct a gospel meeting there um, at, at Figueroa. And uh, I've shared this with some of you before. This was my first time speaking uh, away from my, my home congregation, and the place was packed. It was a Friday night, and I was the last speaker. But Jim, I got up there, and I lost my saliva. I could not, Brother Dave, it was like a big cotton ball was in my mouth. I had studied my lesson. Brother Bowers sitting, here's your professor. He's sitting on the front row with his wife, and he has those glasses, and you had to submit your sermon in writing. And it wasn't any of the sermons that you did during the course. In fact, for me, he gave me a text. He said, Brother Williams, I want you to preach this, and I want you to have your writing first, and I want you to have read, Brother Dave, I got up there, it was traffic. By the time I got up there and got off the freeway, I was frazzled, I was nervous, and I walked in and saw all those people, and I lost my saliva. And there, the reason why I'm sharing this is going back to what Paul was saying when he says weakness and fear and trembling and much trembling. I experienced that. And one of the training things that the techniques that we learned was if you're going to lose, use humor, use it at the beginning, keep it to a minimum, and use it on yourself. Don't go up there talking about, you know, ethnic groups. Don't talk about, you know, women. Don't, no. Keep it brief. Use it on yourself. And so I was totally honest. I just told the crowd, I said, I'm so nervous, I don't have any spit. And everybody started laughing. And the, the point of humor in that is that it relaxes the audience and relaxes you. And it worked. Because right after that, I said a prayer and went right into, right into the lesson. But the Apostle Paul here is talking about how he wasn't all manicured and pretty uh, and, and how even his, his own speech, he was very nervous. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, when he's talking about uh, excellency of speech and wisdom clearing unto you the testimony of God, do you guys remember contextually who he's talking about? You guys remember that? What verse did you read? 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. When Paul is talking about it, I, I, we, we pulled these, verg, these verses out of context for the personal purpose of the lesson, but I wanted to, 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 to broaden our mind to let us know that Paul was talking about some specifics in this text. You guys remember what it was? I thought I heard somebody say it. Who said that? Brother Keith, Brother Keith. <laughs> Apollos, Acts chapter number 18, because the Corinthians... Remember, some, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow all this. So Apollos was this eloquent man. So Paul says, look, I didn't come to you like Apollos. I'm not all polished. I'm not all sharp. I'm not declaring anything to you except for uh, Christ Jesus and him crucified. And my speech, verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of God's spirit on his Life. So it's a wonder, wonderful, wonderful text. It is not the declaration of the authoritative uh, word of the Son of God. Uh, oh, if it is not, I'm sorry. The declaration of the authoritative word of the Son of God, then it is not preaching. You can go to Galatians chapter number 6, verse 1, uh, Galatians chapter number 1, verse 6 through 9. The gospel preacher or teacher does not tr uh, create facts. He is given them by the king, and he must not alter them. 1 Peter 4.11, the preacher speaks as a herald announcing the message of God, declaring the facts of God's word, not his own, preaching or teaching, if it is to please God and save men, must be identical in content and spirit with the preaching of the apostolic days. It's, it's funny that we would have to uh, go over this, but... Sometimes when we don't go over the basics to reinforce where we should be going and what we should be doing, then it's too easy for us to, to go astray. <clears throat> what is good preaching and teaching? I put these in for bullet points. We won't go to all of these. I think Sister D, you asked about some, some, some notes or a handout. We will certainly uh, provide that. Um, I typically don't do that very much. 
I, I certainly can and certainly will. And uh, this just goes to kind of how I was trained in that when you take your own notes, I don't know if you guys know this, but when you write things down, it's like a 20 or 30 percent more retention than if you just listen to it. But if you write, there's, there's your brain, there's something in your wiring of your brain that allows you to retain it a little bit more. So that, that's kind of how I develop my habit, but I certainly can, we certainly can provide a handout. But I say that only because it's good for all of you guys to take notes. The only exception is when Brother French is preaching. <laughs> Brother French is preaching, just forget it. I tried to keep up. I could not write as fast as he was quoting scriptures. So he's probably about the only exception. What is good teaching or preaching? Good teaching or preaching is not a parade of one's knowledge. It's not where we are puffed up. It's not where we think we're all that in a bowl of chips. Uh, it's not a show of one's speaking ability, fashion display, or an effort to build a personal following. It is Bible-centered, it harmonizes with the truth, it is simple, it reveals both the uh, awfulness of sin and it reveals the love of God through Christ. It is well-rounded and then it's, it accomplishes it, its intended purposes. Again, what we're talking about or trying to differentiate is speaking or teaching as opposed to effective speaking or teaching. Any one of us can get up and, and say a few words. Any one of us can offer that, but we want to uh, look at some, some ways. I mean, again, we don't want to exclude the Holy Spirit. That's not the purpose of this class, uh, but we want to make sure that we have at least said, okay, I think I know how to teach, or I think I know how to preach. Are there some nuggets, tips, tidbits that might help me do better? That's the sole purpose of this. We absolutely must rely uh, on the Holy Spirit. It accomplishes its intended goals, bringing people to Christ so that they may be saved, causing Christians to grow spiritually, and then keeping Christians saved. Those are three powerful, powerful end goals of all of our preaching and or teaching. Uh, some important um, uh, key components, good study and preparation. I didn't put too much into this because we're going to have a whole section on this part. So you may not even want to write any notes on that. <laughs> we're going to have a, go, a whole section on study and preparation. Communication, we'll have another section on that. Presentation, we'll have a, present, uh, a section on that. And then the good life, and, and this goes to uh, the last uh, class, the last semester there. Uh, the entire semester was dedicated to the character of a minister or the character of a teacher. And the reason why that is important is because sometimes you may learn something from a drunkard. But that doesn't mean you're going to really stay there and really listen. You know, I mean, you'll, you'll take the five minutes of wisdom that they'll give you, but you're going to be able to know whether this person is sincere based on the life, uh, the life that, they, that they live. Good examples of good teachers, we need to stop nowhere other than Christ Jesus. But for this one, we want to look at Christ and we want to look at Paul. Christ was prepared to teach and he knew the law. One of the more important things besides enthusiasm, besides a willingness to participate, is that we need to spend time to learn our subject matter. I heard Brother Jim say that, and I'm sure Brother Dave and Brother Tony and everybody, they do the same thing, but before they teach the Sunday morning class, they go over the lesson. They write the questions, they think it through, that's part of your preparation so that you'll know the material. They're frank and sincere. Cheer, cheer, uh, uh, Jesus was cheerful and energetic, optimistic, tactful and resourceful, clean in mind and body, sympathetic and kind, one who loved humanity. Amen, somebody. One who loved humanity, spiritually minded and consecrated, meaning set apart, patient and prayerful, and then he did not have much tolerance 
for sin. He had proper attitudes. He loved his listeners. He reproved them when it was called for. He associated with them when he needed to. And he yearned or missed them. Look at the qualities of Jesus. And you wonder how he could start with 12 and go on to today. There's generations and generations and generations of people that are still following him. And if we just kind of extract just a small smidgen of his attributes, it'll be, we'll be amazed at, at what we might be able to do in the service of the kingdom. Then the Apostle Paul, I think in Romans chapter number one, uh, he uh, gave a good uh, analogy in what he considered himself. He considered himself a debtor. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach what? The gospel to you that are in Rome also. Then he goes on in that very famous passage, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What were some of his characteristics? He had respect for the gospel. He was honest and sincere. He declared that which was profitable. His message was limited or specific to the will of God. He did not back down from those who taught things which were contrary to the doctrine of Christ. These are some, to me at least, some very good high level points that as we are thinking about how to serve God and thinking about ways that, once again, we're looking for self-improvement, these are very, very good reminders of some of the goals that perhaps we could, we could uh, seek after. Okay, now that was more of the introduction. Now we're going to slowly start getting into the meat of lesson preparation and delivery. Theology itself is a study in or of the nature of God and religious belief. The study in or of the nature of God and religious belief. When you look at theology, you can generally break it into three branches. And now we're talking about not so much the study, but the uh, dissemination, the uh, distribution, the, the teaching, the preaching, uh, not so much the function, but the follow through of the study of theology. It's hermeneutics, homiletics, and apologetics. If you haven't uh, learned or studied these before, we'll be just going through these very briefly. Uh, we're not trying to make this, as we mentioned before, into a, you know, academic exercise. But hermeneutics really deals with the science of preaching, the accuracy of preaching, and the exegetical nature of preaching, meaning that you are extracting out of the text instead of eisegeting, which means you're inserting your own thoughts into the text. The homiletics is the art of your preaching or teaching. You could almost look at it as the natural disposition of you yourself. Some of us may talk with a little a slang. Some of us are from the country. We might use more um, nature or country examples. Some of us grew up in a, in a gang environment. We might refer back to situations of a hard life. Some of us came out of poverty. But whatever that uh, uh, style or, or natural disposition, that is part of the homiletics. And we'll kind of break this down a little further because obviously that's a, that's a very, very generic uh, description. But then the apologetics, uh, that is the proof. That is the proof of what you're saying and the conviction in what you're saying and then the focused delivery of 
what you're saying. So you could look at it as the science of, the art of, the proof of, the accuracy of, the natural disposition of, and the conviction of or in, then the exegetical nature, then the unique style that you deliver it, but then how focused you are on the content or the material that you are uh, presenting. If we want to look at those a little bit closer, uh, let's look at hermeneutics. Let's get a little definition. It's the study of the principles and methods of interpreting the text of the Bible. That is your clinical uh, definition. And if you uh, wanted to see that biblically, you can go to uh, first, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show who? You got to prove nothing to nobody else. Study to show thyself approved to who? God. To God. What kind of a person? A workman. a workman, someone working in the kingdom that needeth not to be ashamed doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Hermeneutics, the study of the principle and methods of interpreting the text of the Bible. Why is that important? <clears throat> Proverbs 18.21, Brother Keith, we talked about this before when we were dealing uh, with communication in the other class. Death and life are where? And those who love it will eat its fruit. How would death and life be in the power of the tongue? Let's stop for a minute. How would, Brother Tony, how would death and life be in the power of the tongue? Brother Jim, Brother Dave, Sister Leash, how would death and life be in the power of the tongue? How did, how, what did that look like? But, but, but Tony, you got the mic, Brother Jim, Brother Dave, let's, let's go around. I, I just think um, when we consider the things that we say, you know, um, That tongue, as, as the Bible teaches us, is, is, is hard to tame. Yes, sir. And so in and of itself, if you're using it skillfully, mm -hmm. you can use it once again to either kill someone or you can use it to uh, give life to someone. Yes, sir. And, and so I, I just think it's, it's by the things that we say, the mm -hmm. speech that we say, sometimes even when we say the truth. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're not doing anything but killing it because in the, mm -hmm. in the, sometimes it's the, where you kind of like talk about the, homiletic part mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and be using that skillfulness. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that, that's just kind of how I look at it. It's like our tongue can yes. kill someone mm -hmm. as well as it can give life to someone. Amen. 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 Who, somebody else? Can we give the, the sister the mic? I think brother, 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 brother Jim. I just think, um, although pilot is kind of different. Say again, bro. Pilot, pilot. No, oh, pilot. Yes, pilot. yes. Uh -huh. He had the, he had the power on this earth yes. to give to to get to, to let Jesus go, uh -huh. but it wasn't God's will. But he, uh -huh. but if a king or his stature, uh -huh. let's leave Jesus out of it. Uh -huh. He had the power to somebody beheaded or let him go, like Tony said. Also, uh -huh. um, your tongue gets you in trouble. You're on this freeway. You cut somebody out. And now they come up and shoot you. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> your tongue still is going Amen. down there. Amen. Or you can give somebody a compliment. Yes. Give somebody some sound advice. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they can, they can, it can be the opposite. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's go to uh, my sister quick and then we'll go back to Brother Joe. I just want to say just something as simple as what comes out of your mouth, yes. right, is coming from your heart. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we sin in our, in our, 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 our words, our deeds, mm -hmm. you know, our thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, and when it, when it comes out, mm -hmm. it's what's in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Amen. That's the truth. That's the truth. But Gerald. Yeah, your tongue, as we know, we have uh, brothers and Christians in other parts of the world, and just by confessing and teaching about Christ, they're being killed. Amen. Amen. You know, so Amen. Even though they're doing the, the work of the Lord, mm -hmm. It's just like even in the old days when they burnt the Christians, you know, mm -hmm. it all, your tongue, mm -hmm. what you say. Mm -hmm. So pretty much that's how your tongue can mm -hmm. actually 
even in court today, that's what they use, your voice, Amen. your, your, your um, mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Dave? Um, since we all have a tongue, we all, ha we all have that power mm -hmm. to kill or to, uh, mm -hmm. or to give life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, ever since I was very young, I, I, I reasoned about this. That, that I, I thought, you know, how important the word the spoken mm -hmm. word was, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. power that it that it mm -hmm. had, mm -hmm. and it reminds me of this, the, the, the the speeches of uh, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know there are a lot of a lot of those that 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 have that power to mm -hmm. to uh, to draw mm -hmm. you and to give you life, mm -hmm. and also to kill, mm -hmm. you know a father that is telling his five year old or eight year old or teen. Mm -hmm. Constantly, you're worthless. Yes, you're right. good That's for right. nothing. Right. right. And eventually, the, the, the teenager the, kills himself. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So, it, it is amazing how mm -hmm. much power uh, the power yes. of the word uh, can be. Amen. Amen. I, but I, I was going to add, uh, as I was sitting here thinking, the tongue is our only way of communication. I mean, I'm not going to say our only way, but that's how we communicate. Primary, yeah. Yes, primarily, mm -hmm. we communicate from our tongue. Mm -hmm. And so, so now you can see the power in the words mm -hmm. of what we said, you know, mm -hmm. or what's being said. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just like silencing my tongue when I know there's, diff there's danger out there, mm -hmm. you, know, if we, if we, you know, if we look at it or... Um, some of the things that, you know, like you said, we, we say things and instill things mm -hmm. in people's mind. Mm -hmm. So the tongue is a very powerful mm -hmm. tool mm -hmm. that can be used for good yeah. and it can be used for evil. That's right. And That's so right. when we look at it simply because that is the way that we communicate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the most mm -hmm. part. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, in and of itself, it can give life, it yeah. can give death. You know, we have no greater example than the serpent. What did he say? Yea, hath God said? Are you sure about that? Are you sure it was this that God said don't, don't eat from? Are you sure it was that one? Yea, hath God. Why don't you think about that a little bit more and come back and talk to me? <laughs> He's using deceit. He's using his tongue. Also in Acts chapter number 6, if you all remember, towards the end, I think it's in the verse number 40, 44, somewhere in there, uh, they had riled up the men and produced, the scripture says, false witnesses against Stephen to accuse him. And where are we right now in Acts chapter 21 when the Apostle Paul is uh, just getting arrested and he's on the, at the Antonia Fortress, he's on the steps, he's about to give this sermon. But they said, oh man, we saw you with Trophimus. You took him into the temple, didn't you? No, he didn't. But the power of the tongue, you can go through, uh, remember Brother Keith, uh, the, the men of the Bezor sort. Uh, when you go back into Acts and you start looking at uh, what was happening in, in Berea and Thessalonica, and the, the, they went down and got those Market Street brothers to come out and, and raise up a ruckus. So hermeneutics, Titus chapter number 2, verse 1 and 2, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Do you guys know what that word, what that means, sound doctrine? <clears throat> right teaching. That's right. Speak what? The things which become sound doctrine. In other words, he's saying, wait a minute now, now, now Mr. Uh, Titus, don't just get up there and start letting go with your words. You have to have a goal and or a direction. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 11, we referenced this earlier. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as to what? As to the ability that God giveth. So the style, the way you, your experiences, the things that you bring to the table might be different from my experiences. 
But if God gave you that ability, then you do the best you can with that ability that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Hermeneutics, Matthew 12, 37, But I send to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be what? Justified. And by thy words thou shalt be what? Condemned. Look at the two extremes. It's like night and day. Every time I read that, Brother Tony, I think you can talk your way to hell. Never mind committing murder. Never mind shooting up somebody's house. Never mind all the other horrible things that we could do. Matthew 12, 37 is saying, literally, if you look at it literally, you could talk your way to hell. So that is a hermeneutics definition. It's a plural in form, but singular or plural in construction. The study of the methodological, methodological uh, principles of interpretation as of the Bible. A method or principle of interpretation uh, of a uh, philosophical hermeneutic. Hermeneutics, plural, in the fourth, uh, let's see. Yeah, I wanted to go here. And only the reason I wanted to go here because some, some people catch it, some people don't. When we say hermeneutics, that's, that's kind of like an academic term. You don't find that word in the Bible. It's an academic term. But it actually has some origins in Greek culture. Uh, when you look at Hermes, he was a Greek god of commerce, and he was eloquent. He was inventive, he traveled, and then he was one that was a heralder. In fact, if you go back over to the book of Acts, and they said, that when, when they thought that uh, the Apostle Paul, I forget where he was traveling, your brother's got to help me, but the one they thought he was, they thought they were gods, remember that? And one of them was Hermes, or Mercury. Mercury, if you go down, was a Mormon god of commerce, eloquence, travel, and basically sometimes Hermes and Mercury, Mercury are used interchangeably. That's a really small tidbit, but when uh, you are out conversing to people with people and they, and they start talking about hermeneutics, I just think it's good for you to have in your back pocket that you, that you kind of know where that comes from. Homiletics, the art of, the natural disposition of, unique in style. Homiletics. Uh, uh, comes from the word homily, which basically means a sermon. Homiletics is the art of preparing sermons or studies or lessons or preaching. Uh, those who study homiletics seek to improve their skill at communicating the gospel and other biblical topics. That is why we are going over this, because we're not to say that anybody can't get up and begin to expound on their personal experiences and, and how the Lord has blessed, has blessed you, because he's done that to all of us. But what we're trying to do is gain little nuggets where we might improve on where we think we already are. We want to humble ourselves and just say, well, maybe there's something I can get a little bit better at. So that's what... Uh, you start getting to homiletics. Historically, homiletics has integrated biblical teaching and rhetoric. We'll, we won't go too far into it, but I mentioned before, uh, we'll look a little bit at the five canons of rhetoric. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit more. And that's, when I say rhetoric, it's kind of a cleaned up, word, cleaned up version of argumentation. Not argumentation in a bad way, but if you're having a conversation with someone and you are presenting a point, and they're presenting a counterpoint. And we'll talk about Hegel's dialectic thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. We'll talk about that later. But this is a way for you, from a biblical perspective, to improve on how you can be concise when need be. You can, as we mentioned with Brother Bowers, sometimes there are certain subjects that you're, you're, you're talking on, and then there's other subjects that you just touch them while you're passing by but you don't want to allow those side subjects to pull you off course. You just touch it, but you keep going. You touch this, you keep going. You touch this, but you're going in a certain direction because you have, uh, you have a goal in mind. The art of speaking persuasively, and we, 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 we put in parentheses, for effect. Not just talk, but you are, one man does what? Plants. 
Null Amanda's what? That's what we're about. And we want to be effective in, uh, in those things. Homiletics came to us by way of Latin from the Greek homileticos. I have a problem saying that sometimes. Meaning affable or social. Homileticos <laughs> came from homilin, meaning to talk with, to address, to make a speech, which in turn came from homilios, of the Greek word for crowd or assembly. That is where we get the uh, background on homiletics, which in turn uh, came, yeah. Okay, homilios, when you continue to go down, and uh, homilin also gave English by way of uh, Latin homilia and French uh, homily. The word homily, which is used for a short sermon, a lecture, or a moral theme, and for inspirational catchphrases or platitudes. Like homily, the English word homiletic focuses on the morally instructive nature of a discourse. Homiletic can also be used derogatorily in the sense of becoming too preachy. You're sitting up there, now you're starting to lecture people. And it's kind of like um, you already sold them the refrigerator. <laughs> Now you're about to talk them out of buying it. <laughs> you sold the house. Now you keep going, and they don't, they don't want it anymore. <clears throat> Last one for tonight, apologetics. Apologetics is even something for myself. I had not um, studied too heavily. I am still a student of all these, uh, just for uh, you know, transparency on that. Uh, but apologetics is a, is a different subject, and there's, there's whole groups of people that now have studied this apologetics. The English word apology comes from the Greek word meaning to give a defense. That's what apologetics basically means, and you go and you begin to study it. it it's, it's the portion of Bible study and interpretation where you learn how to defend the gospel. You learn how to defend it in a, let's say, in a non-intrusive setting. But Gerald, you're having dinner, and your little nephew is there, and he brings up something that you have a defense for as far as the gospel, uh, the origin of the Bible, um, you know, is, is Jesus God, um, uh, salvation, is there such thing as a devil, you know, things that uh, would cause you to have to give a defense, that whole category in the uh, world of theology comes under the umbrella of apologetics. Christian apologetics, then, is the science of giving a defense of the Christian faith. And the reason why this part, although it's last, it's really good, is because sometimes over the course of your teaching, you're going to find common rejections. You'll, you'll, you'll find common rejections or common roadblocks that people are dealing with. And when you start to study apologetics, you'll begin to learn some of the uh, factual defenses that you can give and that may help you in this in this regard. I'm not talking about argumentation here. We're just talking about being able to defend uh, the gospel. There are many skeptics who doubt the existence of God, attack belief in God of the Bible, attack the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible, false teachers who promote false doctrines, deny the key truths of the Christian faith. So these are some of the reasons why we study this. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 15 helps us it says, but in your heart, set apart as Christ's Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. Remember this, Brother Jim? Who what? Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That hope is in Christ Jesus. So sometimes in the church, we have taken this to mean that Every time somebody asks you a question, you got to jump up and argue and fight with them. No, the answer that you are looking to give 
is in the hope. You say, well, I believe Christ Jesus because of this. I believe that Jesus is coming because of this. I believe that's where you're giving that, that answer. The caveat is if we win a debate but turn a person even further away from Christ by our attitude, we have lost the true purpose of Christian apologetics. There are two primary methods of apologetics. Uh, the first one is a classical apologetics, which involves sharing proofs and evidences that the Christian message is true. I personally, personally like to study biblical archaeology, for example. Places, dates, artifacts, things that can be proven by the known world that correspond with the scriptures. This is a very valuable portion of your apologetics when you have these discussions with people. Just like this Sunday, I mentioned Hezekiah's Tunnels. It was a, it's a scientific fact that it had been written in the scriptures centuries ago. And they didn't find Hezekiah's tw- tunnels, I believe it's like the 40s or 50s. It's been a while since I, since I searched and studied it. But that is part of your um, classical apologetics. The second one is, is presuppositional. I don't get into this very much, but involves confronting the presuppositions or preconceived ideas and assumptions behind anti-Christian positions. This would be something where, Brother Jim, like, like we say sometimes, um, know your opponent. Know what the Methodists think or know what the uh, uh, Buddhists think or know what Seventh-day Adventists think or know what the atheists thinks. That also comes under the umbrella of apologetics, but that is presuppositional um, apologetics. So I think for tonight, I want, I want to stop here. That We went into some definitions. We went quite a bit into some things, and then we started late, and then we were, we're, we're a little bit over right now. So... Uh, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate you uh, dealing with my tardiness. Uh, I would like to ask if there are any comments or questions first, and then if there are any prayer requests. I'd like for Brother Gerald to prepare his heart for any prayer request. Um, I would say on prayer requests, the first one is please pray for, I've, I've mentioned them several times, is David and Diane. Uh, their mother passed away on the 4th of July. And the funeral services are this coming Tuesday, and uh, I will be participating in, in the services to, to, help, to help the family. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday at 1 o'clock, so it is the Lothridge and Grayson family. If you guys can pray for them, they lost, uh, they lost their matriarch, so we're going to be there with them uh, to help them with this time of grief. Anyone else? Anyone else? But T. <laughs> yes. Hey, Tony. Safe trip up there. <laughs> we just want to uh, thank everyone uh, for their prayers on our behalf uh, to allow us to get there safely and uh, mm-hmm. to get back home <laughs> safely. Amen. Amen. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. Anyone and, else? And, and I have a procedure on Friday. Hmm. It's, you know, it's just a simple thing, but, you know, okay. sometimes those simple things can go bad. But we just pray that uh, pray anyway. all goes well. That's right. That's right. Also, please pray for Derek. He'll be leaving on Thursday. He will be driving back to his, uh, his, his assignment. He's going to be leaving Thursday, so pray for him. But, Dave, you have a prayer request? Or, no, no, I just, again, like Tony, I just want to say... Uh, Thank you for your prayers and Amen. thank God for a safe trip. Safe trip. And Amen. the opportunity to see family members and mm-hmm. be together and mm-hmm. uh, enjoy one another. So Amen. I, I thank God for that. He made, made it possible. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. We also want to make, uh, make known that uh, on the 25th of July, we will be having um, the first uh, area-wide singing here. It's going to be on the afternoon uh, from 2.30 to 4.00. Uh, we are waiting to the very last moment to decide if it's indoors or outdoors. We've been, we're prepared for either direction, but we've been watching the news reports, and we're just, we're going to make the decision this week. Uh, we have been advertising for people to come, uh, but we wanted to clarify to them whether it's going to be indoors or outdoors. Uh, and Brother Vilch will be here uh, that day, and the subject that we gave him was uh, um, 
Haggai chapter number two, uh, the verses number four. We wanted some encouraging and uplifting sermons, and so I'm sure he is prepared. I know he's prepared. <laughs> so without further ado, um, did anyone have any prayer requests for the key? Yeah, uh, Nadine Shabazz. Oh, yes. She yes. Uh, sent out a memo and said, uh, pray for her. She got chest pain. She's stressed out. And, okay. You know. Okay. Okay, Nadine, we received your message. We are praying for you. We love you. We still hoping and praying one day you're going to walk in that door. <laughs> but uh, we certainly will be praying for you. Um, with that, uh, my brother, can you close us with a prayer? Shall we bow our head and go to our Father? Dear most precious Father God, we once again come to your throne through your Son, Jesus Christ, asking for prayers, Father God. We thank you for returning our brothers from their trip, Father God, uh, Dave and Tony. We pray for Derek. We pray for our sister Shabazz, Paula. Father God, we continue to pray for those that are sick, the Grayson family. We continue to pray for those that are going through loved ones who have passed and, and left this earth, Father God. But we also thank you for the beautiful message that Brother Darrell had opened up and opened our hearts to so we can continue to grow, so we can do your will, Father God, and grow as strong Christians, Father God. We just thank you for all the things you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.